OK, so th thanks a lot. Uh, it's very nice to have this little meeting during these two days. So, so thanks. Uh, yeah, this is part two following Gemi's lecture on what we call the dictionary, which is a transition from a Wynton structure with the left shed's vibration to a front projection. That is to say, the Legendron version of a Kirby diagram. So Emmy did explain how to do that when the Weinstein left shift vibration had a fiber which was AN. It might happen that I have time to comment what happens when the fiber is, say, DN or E6, E7, or E8. But we will mainly focus on this case. So the plan is that I will first give a family of examples that are interesting for several reasons. So we will comment it, and we will see how the dictionary works. Part B will be about a couple of tricks that simplify your life and leave some open questions regarding Chekhanov and Clifford Taurus. And then part C is going to be three examples that actually are very similar but have completely different features. And finally, part D, we're going to apply this to homological mirror symmetry with an example that we find it's quite neat and it, it works out well. So there are other applications of, of the theory. So there is this sort of the punchline of Emmy's lecture is that what she said is true. OK, that was the theorem. <laughs> so kind of now, OK, you, using that, now we're going to prove other stuff. Historically, this all started because uh, we wondered whether the negative power of a dent twist was actually giving over twistedness. And, and this developed into this general machinery. So in any case, let's start with the XAB family. So this is a family of affine algebraic manifolds, which are hence Stein surfaces, or Stein manifolds of some dimension, which was indicated to us by Paul Seidel. And they have the following form. So we call them XAB. And they're the zero set of the following polynomial. So x to the a, y to the b, and then certain sum of variables squared. And it doesn't matter, whatever dimension is needed here. So let's say n. And then you take 1. So why is this particularly interesting? Uh, so Paul and Maxim Majdanski already studied those families. And I will comment on that. But it gave algebraic varieties which actually have vanishing symplectic homology if you choose the value a equals 1. Actually, Emmy proved that, though it wasn't stated in this way. And so we actually wonder what happened with A and B in general. So the way you might want to think about this and why this is not obviously SH non-zero is that this singularity here, so if you put everything vanishing, is a non-isolated singularity. If you had an isolated singularity, you would morsify it, and that would give lots of Lagrangian spheres, which would imply that symplectic homology doesn't vanish. But now we have a kind of a funny thing. It's the Miller fiber of a non-isolated thing. So you know, maybe life is slightly more subtle. And it is more subtle. So uh, maybe the first statement is that these manifolds have completely different behavior depending whether a is 1 or, high, or greater than 1. So uh, we will see that a equals 1 versus a strictly greater than 1 makes a difference. So the way we will see that is we will just draw them. So how do you draw them? Well, you first write a left shift vibration, because our dictionary inputs this data the manifold and a specific left shift presentation. So how to draw this? So what you do is. You forget about the z-square. Usually in life, every time there's a z-square, that's equivalent to stabilizing. It's like adding a pair of critical points that cancel. So let's forget about this for a second and just focus on this kind of polynomial here. So you see, if we map to something like x plus y, the fiber is going to be some monomial equal to 1. So we're going to obtain that the solutions of the fiber is just roots of unity. So the point is that there exists a map, which is just the linear map going from our manifold to C, given by the point gets mapped to x plus y, such that the fiber is a k for some k, well, it's probably a plus b minus 1. So OK. Then the projection of this has a certain number of vanishing cycles. And what I'm going to claim is 
what is the set of vanishing cycles that these things uh, correspond to. So such that the vanishing cycles, so VC is going to stand for vanishing cycles, are exactly, so now we use what we learned in Emmy's lecture. Feel free to ask again. It's something, it takes some time to kind of digest. Now, in order to draw that, we draw first AK. The vanishing cycles are going to be exact Lagrangian spheres in AK. So now, using what Emmy did, we can draw those as matching paths for another left shift vibration of AK. That's the by left shift vibration picture. So AK is going to have a certain number of points. Maybe imagine we get this. So this would be, here's a zero section, here's another zero section, another zero section, another zero section. So that would be A4, for instance. So here I'm drawing in this figure, we're seeing x to 3 mapping over C with fiber A4. And the vanishing cycles are going to be represented by path between the critical points, so-called matching paths. And in here, you can check that the paths are exactly giving you this very nice picture. And this is a general fact. In general, you're going to have A plus B critical points in here which is an A plus B minus 1 Miller fiber. And the only thing I have to tell you now is the order. So the order is counterclockwise, so clockwise following the interior. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. OK? So point is, someone comes and says, can you study this symplectically? Can you give, say, SH or tell me if this is a non-flexible white C manifold? Well, you take a left shift vibration, say a generic linear section, you draw this, which is something that you can do, student can do, or a computer can do. And then you apply the dictionary in order to draw these guys. So the rule of the dictionary was exactly that we would establish a given A4 basis. So let's call this A, B, C, and D. And then we would express each of the vanishing cycles, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, in terms of this A4 chain of spheres. So let's see what we get here. So we would get that, let me do this example. So what's one? Well, one is tau b of a, right? Because I can have a, and then I switch like that, flip, and I get this one. So two is going to be tau c of b, same reason. I have two here, b, and then switch like that. And then you can see the pattern in general that you're going to get that three is tau d of c. Four or five are slightly different, but still doable. So that's going to be tau c, tau b of a. That's something that Emmy did, this particular one powers. So we obtain this set of vanishing cycles. OK? So now the goal is to draw those. So let us draw this set of five vanishing cycles. So one, two, three, four, five. And here, there's a small remark I have to make, which is order matters. And the order Emmy used is contrary to all orders in literature. <laughs> so uh, that's fine. I'm just going to stick to literature, a bit of variety. So actually, uh, if you follow Seidel's paper, you should attach 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. OK? So yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Um, we now have to draw A, B, C, and D with this kind of convention. So we have A in here, B in here. Oh, this is too bad. So maybe. So A in here, B in here, C in here, and D in here. OK, these are the balls. So these represent H n minus 1 handles. OK, these are subcritical handles of index 1 less than the critical index. So in general, these are spheres. In the one-dimensional case, which is standard four-dimensional Kirby diagrams, these are one handles, because two handles are the critical ones. And now we have to start plotting things. So for instance, we can start plotting 1. So if you plot 1, you will obtain tau b of a. So tau b of a looks like this. According to in this lecture, you take A, you take B, and because B is above, this is going to be this kind of cusp resolution. Fine. And now, after 1, you can attach 5. So 5 is going to be tau d, tau c of B. So the attachment of 5 is going to be, you take B, you go up to C. That's, maybe, maybe let's try it like that. 
and now you go back again to D. Okay, is the, you see the pattern? So now we're going to have tau C tau B of A. The only delicate part is that now C has to go through D above, but the rest is okay. We just do it like this, and then this. And then finally we have to attach tau D of C and tau C of B. So tau D of C is going to be just this thing here. So that's easy. And finally the red is going to stand for tau C of B. So C now has to go over and now get over B. Okay, uh, sorry if the red is not quite red, but um, okay. So that's it, that's this manifold. And now, if you're brave enough, you can just say, well, compute LCH out of here. But I mean, that's not only brave, it's also stupid, because you can <laughs> simplify this diagram. So let's simplify this diagram. And my claim is that this diagram is actually the connected sum of the spinning of two left-handed trefoils. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're going to draw it, but it's somewhat visible from here. So that's connected sum. By this, I mean spinning. of a left-handed trefoil. So in dimension zero is the S0 spinning, which means just connected sum. But in higher dimensions, you should imagine this spins around. So why is that true? So th the point is that you can cut through the middle, the, the, the yellow and the blue in here, and you can divide the diagram into symmetric parts. And then you can resolve each of the symmetric parts. So now it's up to you or the note takers. I can copy this again, or I can just start erasing things. So uh, I feel like erasing should be OK. I think I'm going to cut here. But uh, yeah, so let's maybe erase from here. So these are two different handles passing through. So you can handle slide one of them along the other, and then cancel the handle which is what Emmy just did by cusping. So if you cusp this and you cusp this, these are going to be Rademeister moves. So might as well forget about everything. And now yellow will become green. Note that I had four one handles, or four subcritical handles, and then five things. So a priori, it might happen that everything cancels and I actually get just one knot. That's what's going to happen. In general, you know, there's no reason. So same up here. I can cancel this by a cusp. So this goes away because of this crossing here. And the same in here. So goodbye. And now the typical thing is that these things will start passing through. So we have this guy here that goes so 1 and 3, and the cusp is up. So you take 1 and 3, and the cusp is up. So you take this thing here and put the cusp in here up. And I think same happens in here. So I mean, in here we have something. And this pulls. So this is 1 and 3, and the cusp is down. So a bit of a mess with colors. But now green and yellow are the same, and orange and blue are the same. So this goes away. And now uh, this gone, you can just pinch in here as well. So pink and, red are, uh, pink and green are still different. And as well, you could pinch here. That, that, that's fine. Let's maybe pinch here. So now red and orange are the same uh, through here. OK. And then still the pink and the green are different. So we can pinch as well. Might as well pinch up here. So we obtain this. And now if you kind of tilt your head mildly, you might see that this is a rather Meister move that you can cook up and pass over. But by passing over, I can pull the cusp. So might as well do this drawing here. OK. And now we have two things, which are exactly this knot cut through here. So the diagram we've obtained is this guy spun around. OK. So yeah. Apologies if it's mildly boring, but I just wanted to show you that this can be done. And out of here, you do not only obtain that this manifold for values a and b being 2, 3 is non-flexible, 
but you can actually compute its symplectic homology. And actually, yeah, Paul, 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 when we first talked about it, he didn't know whether they were flexible. And actually, we haven't seen any computation of SH. So this gives sort of a presentation of symplectic homology just by saying that the Legendre contact homology of this algebra is quite computable. And now, by BE, you can apply Hochschild homology and obtain the symplectic homology. So you know, if a computer or a student has enough faith, you can just compute SH of that. But it is indeed non-zero. Uh, maybe a common, this algebra is a left-handed trefoil, and this actually has no graded augmentation, whereas the right-handed does. So it would have been extremely exciting if this was a right-handed knot for the following reason. It would be at the same time an algebraic variety, and it would have a genus 2 exact Lagrangian. Because the genus 1 copying of the trefoil by spawning it would give you a genus 2 exact Lagrangian. And it would be an algebraic variety with that, which from mirror symmetry viewpoint kind of it, it gives interesting things. So right now we know the left-handed is algebraic. I have no idea whether the right-handed is algebraic. It'd be great. And the thing to notice maybe is that if you invert the order, that exactly gives you the right-handed. And I have no idea, and it's a completely open question what happens if you have the same set of vanishing cycles and it start changing orders. Maybe there's some relation, maybe it has nothing to do one with the other. Okay. So this settles x to 3, and the claim is that this actually works for x a b. You can verify that. And there is a comment I have to make here, which is a equals 1. So in the case where a equals 1, so x a b, the diagram is going to be a plus b roots of unity. And the vanishing cycles are going to be uniting points which differ by a. So in here, a was 2. So we went 1, you jump once, twice. So this is one vanishing cycle. You jump 1, twice, it's another vanishing cycle. So you're going to have this kind of higher dimensional, like say, an octagon, and then jumping 3 all the time, like this. And uh, you can now compute, and you'll get a diagram. And that's going to be a minus a, b torus knot spun around. And higher dimensions by torus knot, I mean, s1 times sn. OK? Uh, so. In the case a equals 1, this is radically different because we get the following chain. So some chain like this, and then the remaining chain like that. Now, this does not tell you anything because I haven't given any order. But if I now say 1, 2, 3, and 4, this is radically different than if I had said 1, 2, 4, and 3. Okay. Actually, this order, this is the second one, is the standard t star sn. Whereas this one is not standard t star sn, because we will now draw it just very quickly. It's exactly what Emmy drew. So you're just going to have 4 is tau 3, tau 2 of 1. So that's now at this point extremely easy to draw. You're just going to have something like that. Just plug in 3, 2, and 1. So you'll do the 3, 2, one, and then you're just going to do something like that. OK? And this is clearly loose, because if I punch here and here, I get the zigzag here. OK? So this is a manifold which has vanishing symplectic homology. And further than that, it verifies the H principle. Well, okay, say, once in H covertism. So great. Purely determined by the almost symplectomorphism type, which is essentially the if type. OK. So are there any questions about this x, a, b family? It's just an interesting family of examples. When a equals 1, they are flexible. And when a is higher, you can actually compute exactly what they look like in the front. Symplectic homology is doable from here. And well, I mean, they're kind of interesting family. So I actually don't know the log codire dimension of them. That's something that if somebody does tell me, I'll be very happy about. But OK, so just one family of examples. There are variations of that. You can now change this polynomial a bit and play the same game. And I don't know, this leads to sort of a generic experimental program on you know, what's the density of flexible manifolds between, I don't know, polynomials of degree 4. You take them, you start modifying, and I don't know, what's the interest rate? Kind of interesting, say it's non-flexible. So what's the interest rate of, say, degree 4 uh, polynomials? So I don't know. That's that's. We have no idea. I mean, some of them are flexible, some of them are not. We'll see. OK, so now I want to 
think about the dictionary a bit more uh, and about touristics. So this was an application, something that was not known. So you said that you simple like cohomology, you're using the VDE stuff? Yeah. So over Q, yeah. Or, oh. I mean. Is there a way to like compute like cohomology honestly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not me. I mean. Okay. <laughs> sure. Relying on like the getting finished in order to get the computation. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So the answer is yes. And if you wanted to compute SH, you could just start studying the wrap fluoromology of the vanishing cycles, and that's that's still okay. Oh, okay. But it's non-trivial. Like okay. computing, say, the wrap homology of some of these guys, it involves some time and thought. Whereas you draw it and it's immediate what happens if they're flexible, say. So great. Um, let's move on to the torus tricks. So, so really what M explained kind of settles the program on how to do things and what kind of applications you might have. But there are some nice observations regarding torus, and by torus I mean S1 times Sn, that actually make the whole setup make more sense even. So I, I want to observe the following thing. So we have the, both the Clifford and the Chacan of torus. So given the picture, which is the standard critical point for a left shift vibration, so that's this picture, you can apply parallel transport, symplectic connections, and the standard theory and argue that if you have a curve down here, this actually leads to a Lagrangian. So it's going to be, say, the, the fiber in here, because this is just Cn, is going to be T star Sn minus 1. So this gives a Sn minus 1 times S1. So this is the base, and this is the zero section of the fiber. So to be completely OK, I should actually put a small pigtail, because I want this to be exact. But let's ignore this issue and just think that this is actually an exact torus. So there's both this torus and this torus. I mean, I put the critical point for no reason right now, but you can just put, yeah. Yeah, but the lift is still an embedded Legendrian. Yeah. Yeah, that's why let's forget about pigtails, yeah. So, these two tori are quite famous in our world. One of them is called the Clifford torus, which is this one. And the other is called the Chekhanov torus. So well, it's, they don't need any presentations, I think. So the point is, how can we interpret part of Emmy's pictures in these terms, and so this dictionary machinery? So I want to give kind of two applications. For that, I need to draw them. So in the Legendrium front, This tori look like this. So the first one, which is the Clifford one, it's the confusing one. So it's this torus here. And big dot means symmetrical rotation. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not just a crossing. And the Chekhanov torus is just what Baptiste had considered, which is the spun of the knot. OK? Takes a bit of thought, maybe, to see that this is a torus. But uh, this is one homology class, and that's the other homology class. OK, great. So this is Clifford, and that's Chekhanov. So that's Cliff, and that's Czech. So I want to use those guys in order to interpret, again, the Dent twist, and just make sure that our theory makes sense. So recall that the Dent twist was given by a cusp sum. And the negative then twist was given by a cone sum. So let's see how they interact with these pictures. So now P1 just then twists. Let's start with this configuration. We, we start with one zero section here, A, and another zero section B. This is a purely local picture. And then I'll consider two cycles. One of them, it's this one, also known as tau b of a. And the other one is going to be this one, also known as tau a of b. OK? It's tau b inverse of a. So now you can think of this green guy as being the orange guy. 
summed with a small torus along this encircling. So you can sort of divide. You would like to say, I want to understand what happens when the orange goes and hits the thing. So we might break this into two problems. Draw the orange, draw Clifford, and do something. OK, so I'm going to explain what something is. So uh, I want to express now the orange one by summing it up along this. So this, and then something happening here. And this something in this lower picture has to be indeed doing this. And then this will become the green one. Great. So let's just do that. So in the front, this operation is as follows. You start with the orange one that we've learned it's this. We now draw the Chekhanov, uh, sorry, the Clifford torus, which is this. OK. And well, it doesn't require brutally educated guess to say that this thing here, which is an analog sphere times interval, actually corresponds to this. And the operation takes these cusps and separates them. So we now move and use this operation. And you'll get exactly the green one. OK, there's everyone. So sub substitute the, the, this guy, okay, this, this analog in here, which had coming this cusp like this and uh, this thing. In both cases, this is substituted now by just this. OK, so this is one way of interpreting how to draw green if you know orange. OK, vice versa. How to draw orange if you know green? So slightly more complicated, but still easy. We have this. And now Chikanov Torres says, like, lives in here. And now, well, there's no cusps. So better we put some cusps. So that's the same picture as this one. OK, forget about tangencies. Like, Everyone knows what this means, right? And now this thing is indeed, oh boy, well, this thing in here. So what I want to notice is that this diagram, when resolved, doesn't quite give already the two cusps, but it gives the two cusps being in this position. So essentially, OK, and now we have to see exactly what this means. Because as Emmy pointed out after John very properly asked, is that if one of those guys were not a big dot, were just an actual crossing, we could not just pull it out. Right? That, that's Emmy's picture saying that if I have this with a big dot, you cannot pull it in higher dimensions. But in this case, this is a rotation of a move in 3D, completely symmetrical. So if you see two big dots like that and two cusps intersecting both being big dots, then you can pull them apart. And when you pull them apart, you will recover this picture. So that's a transition from the green one to the orange one. OK? So fine. This is useful in general. One of the applications uh, we have in mind, and that I will not come in now, is that there's something called puncture Lefschetz vibrations, where you don't map into C, but you map into C star, or actually T star is one. And then you will have some hole. Instead, in here, you will have a hole. And you still want to understand how you pass through a hole. And this is exactly telling you how you should pass through a hole. Just taking into account that the monodromy now is what tells you whether it's a Chekhanov or a Clifford torus. OK, that's for the experts. So a second application I want to give about the torus trick is how to compute easily powers of a dent twist. So it, as, as, as Octave asks, uh, it might not be immediate just to say, how do you draw tau b to the fourth of a? You might know how to draw tau b a. But then when you do that, some other intersection is created, which in the front means that some other rep chord is created. And the whole point is, where is the rep chord? Once you like, kind of detect the rep chord, it's great. But the whole issue of this dictionary is it's so local that you completely lose the rep chord. You kind of do something here, and you don't care what the contact homomorphism does outside. 
And so uh, kind of might not be obvious where the rep core is. So there are tricks to go around that. One of them is the stacking trick, which I will not explain, but it's, it's, it, it gives you any power. But via the torus, you can also get uh, powers easily. So how to get powers? So part two powers, I guess. So the fundamental observation comes from the quite simple fact that if I have here A and B to zero sections, it doesn't mean attach, it just means that they are there. And I have the Chekhanov, say, uh, sorry, the Clifford torus in here. Then I might consider having A and then start surfing. Okay. And at some point, do something here. Okay. What will happen if I do something? Well, the result of doing something in this case is exactly obtaining the vanishing cycle corresponding to tau b square inverse of a. So let's see. Let's just see that I make sense. Right? That's the thing we would obtain, which I mean, might as well just draw like that, which is what at some point I may draw, I think. So, uh, and here's the our Chicano. So there must be some condition that gives you this. So that will explain how to draw tau b inverse of a. And in order to draw tau square of a, you can do the same trick, but now surfing underwater. So you go like this, and you do the operation here. OK? Now, we don't quite understand this fully, because all this machinery is based on local models, and it's highly coordinate dependent. So the fact that the positive then twist is a cusp and not a cone doesn't mean anything. I mean, it means something once you fix a coordinate system. But you might as well choose another one. In this case, just interchange A and B. And then the whole thing is going to look like a cone. So it's really the globalizing procedure that gives you the contact topology, not the local pictures. So I'm just going to draw local pictures, but then they have to be globalized. I won't tell you how, but th this should be enough data to get an idea of these. So let's draw the upper one. We're going to have A and we're going to have B. So this is A, this is B, and we have this guy in here. And then Chekhanov, which lives somewhere around here, okay, near the B, the B place. So the claim is that that guy up there does the following thing. Surfing up creates a cone singularity like that. That's a cone, like an actual sphere symmetrical randomizer move. And then the operation, the, this thing in here, it's precisely going to be, so this, this red can go through the handle and we get that. So that's going to be exactly the following picture. It's going to be, um, Okay, so both of these are big dots. Okay, so this Legendrian here represents the, the lift of tau b inverse square of a. So Legendrian lift of tau b inverse of a. And now, how do you do the other one? Well, that's doing essentially the same thing, but now surfing underwater won't create this, but it will create something which is actually spun around and not along a point but an axis so what you get is something like that you get here your Chekhanov uh, sorry your Clifford and then you'll have this so again all, all these things are computations in the sense you have to like go down local systems fix coordinates and that's the picture you get and then the operation here it's going to be this thing here which is indeed an interval times a sphere because it's rotated around. So you might want to think of this kind of MRI scan, ME put from, from the top. And the picture you get at the end is exactly this one. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> OK, so these are the two cusps corresponding here, and I've united them. So again, you cannot pull this cusp unless you're in dimension three. It is illegal otherwise. So this is the Legendrian lift of tau b square of a this time. 
OK, good. So yeah, tori are useful. Okay, How do you draw tau cube or tau to the seventh? You do the chalk trick, which is here where you saw just one going, you just kind of duplicate. You take one of the strands and just put k copies of it. And in here, the same thing, where, where you saw one strand, you just put k copies and all of these big dots. So by, by these, I mean that actually understanding the squares, it's enough in order to compute any powers. So this already gives you a very nice family of flexible Weinstein manifolds in an A2 diagram. And that's where we're moving towards. We're moving towards C, which is A2 examples. So A2 is the case in which I only have two zero sections. So these are three critical points, which is an A2 fiber, puncture torus in 4D. And let's see what kind of examples can we get out of there. So let's analyze those. So for so bar C, maybe. Uh -huh. Let me actually, do you mind if I erase this? Is, is, is this picture kind of clear? OK. So so let's now study, in general, those pictures. What kind of Weinstein manifolds do we obtain from them? So for instance, let's start with a simple example, I'll complete the title, but uh, the toy baby example is the following manifold. So can somebody tell me what is this manifold? Think of the surface case. The fiber of that, yeah, somebody? Puncture, so not quite, I think. So th this is a bi Lefschetz vibration picture, which means that the total space of this is some A2. Now you're going to take the A2 and multiply it by C. And now you're going to draw 1 and 2 and attach two handles along it. So that's right as long as you then attach things. So this manifold is A2 times C plus two handles, so two two handles. Or critical handles in general. And the picture in low dimensions, well, the A2 here is a puncture torus. And then the vanishing cycles 1 and 2 are precisely our old friends stabilizing this. So this manifold is actually a ball. So the conclusion is that this manifold is well, C2, say. OK? Uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, the toy example. And then. More interesting examples happen when, for instance, you consider 1, 2, which is now a ball. And now you touch some random thing. So let me kind of draw something that I'm not able to replicate, because I think it was random. But you, you can just draw whatever thing you like and see what happens. So you just say, I attach 1, I attach 2. This gives me a ball. And now you say, I don't know, this. But that's a perfectly nice Weinstein manifold. And all the information encoded for this Weinstein manifold belongs to a Legendrian. OK? So because we care about Legendrians, the whole point is, how do you draw this? But notice that this is just tau v to the minus k a. So I just told you how to draw this here. It's the square and the chalk trick. So exercise for you at home, draw this manifold, and prove it's flexible. And in general, the manifold given by doing one, two, and an iterated twist here or the other way will give you Weinstein manifolds which are flexible. Okay. So again, this is quite a huge chunk of examples that we do know that give flexible things. So maybe moving forward, apparently simpler examples, we are led to the so-called I. So there is this manifold where you think you understand, and then you do other problems, and it appears again. And it just keeps appearing everywhere. So let's study this. So this is example C1. So this is the I. So I should write a long list of names 
I'll just say them. So Richard Harris was the first one studying this, I think indicated by Paul Seidel and Ivan Smith. Then Maxim Majdansky further studied this manifold, which I will not describe. And then Emmy and Kyler Siegel also proved uh, what Harris had kind of heuristically proved that this manifold is actually interesting. And I will suggest another way of proving this. So I don't know, lots of names. So what's the I? Well, let's take an A to fiber. And let's, instead of attaching these zero sections, well, let's attach this. This is kind of dumb, because I could just cancel this, and I would just obtain an A1 fiber. So it's just a subcritical thing. But now the second guy you attach is this one. OK? So let's see how to draw this. I can take the zero sections here, A and B. So let me just draw this in, in orange. So this is A and B. One is just tau B of A, two is tau A of B. So this manifold is exactly given by first drawing, doesn't matter the order in this case. So you first draw this, and now you draw the cone. So this manifold is exactly this, right? Because I can cancel, I can handle slide, cancel this, cusping, and do the rather Meister move, and I'll get just this big dot in here. So this is extremely interesting because, well, you should think of this as a surface in, say, the five-dimensional case, well, where, where this is a Legendrian in a boundary which is a fivefold. And, but you can also, of course, consider this as being a knot in S3. So several interesting features of this. So in dimension three, this knot, so this Legendrian, is loose which means that this Weinstein manifold is zero vanishing as age and kind of not interesting. Uh, just for fun, this is, algebra, this is also an algebraic manifold. It's this manifold here. So I don't know. I mean, algebraic geometers should help us a bit in what kind of manifold should we look for exotic phenomena. Uh, where? Sorry? On the Y? On the Y? Y squared. Is it x squared, y squared, minus x? I thought it was just x, y, minus x. Yeah, that's right. x, y? That's completely right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so this is loose. An extremely cool fact. In dimension 5, it's not. Why is it called an I? Nothing well, I mean, <laughs> I can kind of like. Isn't this isomorphic to kind of, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so it's not loose, and I can safely say I have no idea whether this is true or not in higher dimensions. God knows whether this thing is loose or not. So, psychologically. The reason this is not loose, you might think of it, it comes from the fact that the Legendrian contact homology of the Clifford torus, if twisted, is non-zero. And this is essentially a Clifford torus that now passes through the handle. So maybe, at least to take home, you might think that this picture is something non-trivial that now passes through the handle and kind of maybe becomes trivial. But it doesn't. It states. OK? So I won't prove that. So Kyler computed the symplectic twisted homology of this, symplectic homology, twisted coefficients, and proved that SH was non-zero, which proves that these things cannot be loose. OK? But I suggest that we develop a technique such that we can also say that only through Legendrians, which essentially involves understanding this cone. This cone is very well understood in terms of flow trees, like uh, Tobias Ekholm and uh, Georgos and other people work that. So you very well understand what kind of flow trees can happen in this cone in dimension 5. And then the only thing is generalizing a result of Lenny and Tobias, which is how do you compute LCH in the subcritical, but now in dimension 5, not 3. But uh, I think it's a very doable thing, just we have to do it. But that will give a strictly Legendrian proof of this manifold being interesting. So now we're going to do an apparently simple operation which is we will take the i and just add another handle. So
So if you now take the I and add another handle, you can actually tell me what handle do you feel like attaching, but there's this kind of, there's obvious two choices. So these two examples go by the name of the Andalusian dogs. So what these two examples are, are you take the I and you slit either this cycle or this cycle. So now we either add, so this is one, two, and three, or now one, two, and three. <laughs> so I guess I have to put a reference. <laughs> so, so yeah. And so Spanish cinematography leads to yeah, <laughs> this notation. So extremely interesting thing, the eye was not flexible. Now we attach a critical handle. And the claim, the theorem, is that the dictionary tells you that these two guys become flexible. So what we see is that there is a flexible manifold. And inside of it, there's a sublevel set that actually is not flexible. So like full details of that appear in an article of Emmy and Kyler. They have something called the subflexibilization procedure. Yeah, come up with a better name, please. And then you will be able to see that, in this case, you, you obtain these two guys. It's not hard to draw. Notice that 1 and 2, we already knew how to draw. And then the only point is whether you draw three here or three here. And you're going to obtain, so this guy on the left is going to be this manifold. Just trust me. I mean, do it, but it's, you should get this result. And this guy here should give you this manifold. OK? And these are obviously flexible if, if you think enough. For instance, in this case, these two are the same handle, and I can pass one of them through. So this tells me that this is the same manifold as doing the following thing. So you pass through, you pass through, and now you go through. And now this has this handle here that we now collapse. So we obtain this. And that's a big thing. So now I can just change this and move this thing down. So this thing, by a Rademeister move, can just move down. And that creates a loose chart. So this proves that this manifold is flexible. Okay. What's happening, by the way, is that the twisting comes from an homology class that then dies when you go there. So you cannot argue that twisted symplectic homology of this thing is also not zero. There's no kind of terrible thing. So yeah, due to the lack of time, I have 10 minutes. Uh, I want to move to application D. But please uh, ask any questions or doubts about anything. So the other one is also flexible? Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah. Slightly trickier, but yeah, also flexible. Yeah, you have to do one more move than in here, but it is great. So uh, yeah. yeah, I encourage everyone to just draw your favorite diagram and see what happens. So okay, let's move to D. By the way. This should, at some point in life, give us examples of Legendrians that give exotic complex affine spaces, say C3, C4. I mean, the literature is kind of full of examples of ex exotic symplectic structures in, uh, say, C3, C4, C5. Like Lenny has one of the examples. I think Ivan has another one. And uh, it, it's, it's nice the way they're constructed. And usually SH is detected, in the, the exoticness. But I don't know any example of a precise knot. I think the knot you use has to be stabilized in order to get something. But I mean, it's not the knot. So it'd be really nice to just have a knot saying, this is an exotic C3. So it's easy now to draw candidates. You just draw something that topologically cancels and then hope for the best. But yeah, so D, an application to mirror symmetry. So. So I want to start with an apparently simple question, which is, how do you draw T star T2? So I'm going to give you a way to do it using a dictionary. So <coughs> this Stein manifold, I mean, with the standard structure that it has, uh, given by the Cotangent bundle, can be drawn via the dictionary. And 
And maybe what's mildly exciting is that it does not uh, have an AK fiber, it has a DK fiber. So I don't know. I wanted to do an example of a DK fiber. So uh, may maybe that, that will use. So with a D4 fiber. So uh, this particular thing comes from the potential in mirror symmetry, the Z plus W plus 1 over ZW that Paul and Elsa had studied. And it gives the following presentation. Only you, yeah, only Paul. I mean, it's obvious, but I don't know. Kind of. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> just take whatever you feel, and it's going to give you left shift vibration. For instance, the super potentials coming from the Laudan Ginzburg model and homological mirror symmetry give you a nice set of potentials. So, if you use those, you're going to get left shift vibrations. And if you use the potential given by so if you, you, you could either use the potential coming from the sum. OK, so that's the mirror of just CP1. So it's C star with this potential. But you could also glue these two guys together. So that's, that's another one. So in any case, you use, you use this. And you're going to get that T star T2 has this nice picture. It's this fiber, which is the plumbing given by the DK dinking diagram, where the guy touching everyone is this thing. And then the other vanishing cycles are going to be turning around once every time. So it goes around once here, here, and here, and then twice. So um, apologies, but kind of twice, twice, and twice. OK? So fast, this is, say that this guy is D. So the first one will be D. The second one will be the other diagrams, so that's tau c square of d. And the other one will be just tau a, tau b, tau c of d. So these are the three vanishing cycles. And you can now run the dictionary, but you have to be careful because you don't run it with an AK fiber. You run the dictionary with a DK diagram, which means one guy intersecting all the other guys. OK? You see that this is DK. It's like one guy. And it's going to share a rep core with here, here, and here. So it's exactly this follows the D4 configuration. So usually depicted like that. But don't get confused. These edges has nothing to do with the other edges. Okay, It's just intersection pattern. OK, so uh, how you draw this? Well, this D down here. This D in here is going to be this D here. Then we're going to have these squares. Well, I just told you a couple of blackboards ago how to draw squares. So the squares are going to be like that. Can you tell the difference? I mean, I cannot tell the difference. <laughs> so the squares, if you draw them, are going to be like this. Things going up and down, but we're in the 3D case. So this cusp pulls down. So this is just this guy here. And this is the presentation you have. So this is this cycle in here. Great. And finally, the remaining cycle, which is the orange one, it's going to be just the then twist, standard one. So you get this manifold. OK. So. Here's C star T2. I don't know. And you can simplify it a bit. So um, the diagram now simplifies. It's actually reasonable to believe that this should go down to two one handles and one two handle, as the standard C star T2 does, I mean, even symplectically. And indeed, it does. So this goes down to the following. So this diagram ends up being the following. There's a hole in here. These are two handles. So in here, I'm, I will cancel this one and this one. So I'm drawing the remaining two handles. So it's this diagram in here. So yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's C32. A really simple way to see that is just count. So one intersection point, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Orient this manifold. You will see that if you oriented 
these three points are positive, these two points are positive, this is negative, and this is positive. And then we can compute out of here the rise, and we can also compute the number of cusps. So the rise is 6 minus 1, and the number of cusps is 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So over 2, this gives 4, which concludes that the TV of this guy is 1. So it's framing 0, so it's a trivial D2 bundle over T2. And actually, you know it's a Stein one, it's the correct one, because you build it out of the Lefschetz vibration. So maybe the remark in here is that please compare with what usually happens in the literature, which is that you take the standard Kirby diagram, which is just given by, say, two blacks, two, two whites, and then the commutator relation, and you start like moving them around and putting them in a genuine form, and then you add a zigzag in order to change the framing. And then the picture you get, it's this torus that appears in several articles, which again, you can easily compute. It has all the points being positive, except for this one, which is negative. And so it has 4 minus 1, 3. So that's the right. And then the number of cusps is 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's 2, 3 minus 2, TB1. So that's also the same. But the point is that, we, you know, this one, I'm sure it's the standard is 32. This one, I don't see it, like, directly. I think you should argue something or maybe prove it's the same than that one. So in the last half a minute, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give an example of how to apply this, this dictionary and this legendaries to homological mirror symmetry. So, C, so D2 is that we can consider the Weinstein manifold C2 minus a conic, so xy equals 1, OK? And then you can compute the mirror. So the mirror people will tell you how to do that. So if you want like a potential, that will give you the compactification, so on and so forth. But what we do here is we present it with a Lefschetz vibration, so which is represented by the following picture. So if you know a bit of mirror symmetry, if there was a hole here, that would be the mirror of T star T2. Putting a hole is smoothing the complement, and that corresponds to one handle attachment. And so that's, that's where you put the section, because it's a bi its vibration. Sorry, it's a bit technical. So this diagram with the following order, 1, 2, 3, gives that's really nice exercise to do at home, and I'm really fond of it. The first time I draw it was with Nick in the fourth floor of the IIS, so I, 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 yeah, I really remember it. So this manifold is this one, which is quite famous in smooth topology dimension 4. It's the cusp. And uh, now, what, what can we do? Well, we can compute the LCH, which I... Do I have one minute, maybe? Is it too cruel? We started like a little bit late. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cut me, cut me close. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, now we can compute LCH, and we can do this in full glory thanks to Tobias and Lenny's paper about subcritical computations of LCH. And you put this in a Lagrangian form and apply the algorithm. There's going to be the standard rep cores coming from here plus the rep cores coming from the handle, which is essentially one rep core between here and here. And then the iterates given by the rep orbit, which is gives more. And uh, you will see, I mean, I can do the computation if you want, dinner or later. But the degree zero guys end up being generated by x, y, and then some mysterious guy called C012 and C210. And then the relations, there are certain relations, which I mean, I'm going to write them, but don't worry. So it's the same one. And now these two assume that it commutes. So that's the first relation. And the second relation is uh, this. So that's, well, T. Well, let's specialize and constant coefficients, something like that. So. Uh, there's, with these two commuting, these two commuting, and everyone commuting with everyone. And here I've computed coefficients specializing with the coefficient ring homology equals to 1. Sorry, this is a bit fast. But the point is that the spectrum of this algebra is going to give you the fine mirror of that manifold. As it turns out, the spectrum of this algebra 
is exactly xyz polynomial ring mod xy plus 1 z equals to 1, which is the localization of three variable polynomials along a conic, which is the complement of a conic. So this tells you that the affine mirror of this is this guy, is this algebra, which means that the rap category associated to this is exactly modules over this guy. So you can now compute db Koch of the complement and tell you what Lagrangians in the rap category correspond to which coherent shifts on the mirror, which as you see, the mirror is exactly the same one. So C start, so C2 minus a conic is self-dual, and you can actually establish the correspondence going through LCH. Obviously, the right isomorphism is LCH equals, you know, SH through BE. SH is the Hodge homology of the wrap. By mirror symmetry, the homology of the wrap is the homology of uh, the DB Koch, and that's exactly polyvector fields. And in degree zero, that ends up being global sections of the structure sheaf, and that's exactly the spectrum of this algebra. But in any case, that gives a way to look at mirror symmetry from the Legendrian viewpoint. I'm done.